The word passion is used a lot when it comes to photography. It's one of the easiest ways for us to describe how we feel about making photographs. But there are some people for whom the word passionate is a pitiful understatement. Erica Larson's work is special, not because it's beautiful and that it's been published in magazines like National Geographic. It's because of the stories she tells through her images, whether it's of the Arctic Circle Sami people or Native Americans' relationship to horses. It's about her dedication to making those photographs happen. Not only has she spent years on a subject matter, but she's also learned an entirely new language, learned how to prepare reindeer meat, and completely opened herself up to the communities she is welcomed into. The lengths to which Erica will go to create her photographs are remarkable, but it's the humanity she brings to the effort that makes her and her work so exceptional. This is Ibarian X, and welcome back to The Candid Frame. Well, I'm really pleased to have a chance to talk with you. I enjoyed your presentation a couple of weeks back. Thank you. I'd see, I've been seeing your work for a long time, but it was the first time I'd actually seen you speak about it. And uh, yeah, you, you leave quite the impression. <laughs> <laughs> you have quite, I talk to a lot of people who have quite a commitment to photography, but uh, uh, yours is pretty exceptional in terms of the, uh, the lengths that you've gone especially in terms of the duration of time that you've spent with your subject matter in order to create your photographs. Mm. One of the things that I notice about your photographs, and I think it's something that I think for me is I'm, is that I'm learning that sort of di differentiates really exceptional photographers is that they get to a point where it's not so much about the photograph, but it's about the moment. Yes. And I th think you understand what I'm talking about there, but that's not a skill that you come to naturally just by picking up a camera. What elements or what experiences sort of led you to start to understand that it was more about the, the moments than the photographs? Um, to be honest, I think that it's something intuitive in us from the beginning, right? I, I, I have this belief that we are, you know, at the core storytellers. I mean, just as being, as part of our role as being humans. So I think there's this intuitive part of us that knows that. And then there are those of us that choose to sort of tap into that, if you want to say collective storytelling tradition and refine it and kind of fine tune it over the years. So I think, I mean, I think for me, that was pretty clear from a pretty young age. I mean, I think around six years old, I was pretty clear that story was you know, it's, it's part of the way that we experience the world, whether it's through fantasy or even like just how we can interpret the things that are going on outside when, when they're new to you. I mean, these are like we related to our idea of, of other ideas. And therefore, I think it's about story. So my point is, I think it's something that's been like the moment that you're, you're talking about is something I've been intuitively refining since birth. But then I do think there's this time that we're kind of kind of separated from it, right? Like you get this, whatever, you know, well, I should say for me, then, you know, I went to grade school and high school and college and these things. So then there's this time period that you learn to learn other things. And maybe in some of that learning process, you, in order to kind of maybe more rationally take on other aspects of learning, you step away from some of your intuition in that. And and yeah. therefore, but but that's also, I think, important because it helps to refine the intuition when you allow it to kind of come back out. But in that learning process, we begin to understand that there's tools that become sort of extensions of how we express ourselves. And that for me was the camera. But I think I was always very clear that it was a tool and so it was never really about the photograph or, or the camera. Okay, so then you realize it's a tool, but then adding another layer onto it, right? The, the, the tools that we choose are really important. And I think tools, and especially the camera, has this ability to play with time. I look at it, I look at it as a, I really look at it as a type of magic. Anyway, it's the ability to sort of push away these layers of time and, and the veils that are all around us. So anyways, it's a tool to, to, to remind, you know, it's just a tool, but at the same time, then once we realize it brings us to the moment we're there and then it's like, we can put it on and just like push 
our intuition even further into realms that we could never imagine. Yeah, because as as kids, most of us are really natural storytellers. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> Some of us fabricate more and you know more dramatic stories than others, but there's something that comes naturally to kids. And as you said, as you grow up, you become sort of indoctrinated into the culture and the norms, you sort of lose some of that. And the, and the camera really provides you an opportunity to reintroduce yourself to that and hopefully learn how to trust it. And I think that's, that's where the challenge is because you can trust that. But in a world that likes to put everything in boxes and likes to have the, everything rigidly defined, it can be a challenge for some people to be able to sort of let go and just embrace the moment as it reveals itself, right? Mm. Because there's, because for me, the moment is so much about not trying to control it. It's about being present with the moment, and that that has, and that the camera, yes, is the way by by is the means by which I can capture that. But if I attempt to control it or try to rein it in, that's when the pictures can end up being contrived or less than what I might hope for. I think the ability to sort of trust yourself, it's never something that you completely graduate to, at least for me, I'll just speak for myself, that I achieve steps of it, where I kind of let go and I'm getting into the zone and there are times where I take sort of take it back. And there are other times I let it go. And it seems like it's an ongoing an ongoing process. And for you, since with some of your projects, you you spend extended periods of time, as long as like eight years for one of them. How does the fact that you are spending so much time sort of allow you to to get into that space where you are sort of completely trusting that intuition that we're talking about? Well, I think you're talking. So there's a couple of things that I think we're talking about. So the one thing is that you're, you're in one way, we're, then we're assuming that the story is separate from how we are in life in general. So I think for me, what, what I reflect on and what you're saying is that it's, it really has nothing to do with the camera, so to speak, or the, the photograph. This is about how we react to situations in our life. So um, there's times that we want to control things or there's times that we allow ourselves to go deeper into it and become more free. But I think we're, we're just really talking about us and not like, again, right, the camera's just an extension of that. I, I, so, and I think that, that for me, it, it depends how, how we are in, in certain situations. And I think, so then it just gets sort of, I don't know, it gets a bit complex there then, right? It's, it's how you're relating. But, but for me, the trust comes in and not so much in trusting myself, but trusting, again, this idea of the story and that the story is already there. In fact, for me, I'm a big believer that the past, present, and future are all happening at the same time in some regard. And, and, and even if you want to switch that, perhaps even, you know, you're experiencing the, 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 the future in the past and the past in the future. And so I'm believing more in, in the story to reveal those things to me and to help me have a, a greater understanding of actually what it means to just be human and to, to live this life. And so if I, so if I believe in, so maybe I'm just taking all the responsibility off of me because if I just believe in the story itself, well, there is nothing to control then. And because it's going to be what it's going to be. And, and therefore it's, it's how I, how I choose to come to that moment and, and reflect it. And so when you're, you're going to your initial statement about working on things for long periods of time, I actually don't really necessarily see that as something as dedication or something sort of extreme because I, I see the life as one really long story, but you go through these cycles and different chapters mm -hmm. of it. So maybe I'm working on something for eight, for eight years, but it ultimately I was started working on it from, again, from birth. So it's just like, I'm just maybe like, it's like I'm taking the lens and focusing on, a, on this theme, one aspect of very similar themes throughout my entire life. And I'm focusing yeah. on that for eight years, but the story itself is, is a constant. There's no beginning and there's no end. It's just that it's going through these cycles and during certain cycles, I kind of putting myself in and, and focusing on it. So in essence, I don't really see eight years or, or eight minutes as that much of a difference. Yeah. 
Yeah, there's a sort of connective tissue for a lot of your work related to people and the land, people and the animals, people to the environment. There's always a sort of um, relationship thing that's going on with people and, and people and in between people uh, uh, along with that. Uh, and a lot of it has focused on like with the your work with the reindeer people, with indigenous people. But how, how did you s- discover that that was really going to be a, a point of interest for you? Because you were born in D.C., you grew up in the East Coast, and you know, I guess in a suburban or urban you know, neighborhood. Where did you sort of pick up this interest that w- led you to explore areas that most people would never consider examining? Mm, well, I think um, what well, came from... I think originally from a photograph, I remember the first time like I was holding one of the pictures of the planets when they were coming back from the Hubble. And I remember holding, like I was literally holding, (laughs) you know, Saturn in my hand. And I felt in that moment that the camera can bring you to somewhere so far away, you know, that you think, you think it's another universe and it's so far away, but in the moment you're actually holding it. And so there you are with it. And then when you're holding it, you realize, well, this is not so different from me. This is me. This part of the universe is me. And the camera is bringing you there. But at the same time, it is something separate. So the point is, is that I think the things that I'm exploring in one aspect are very separate from me. They're things that, especially in this sort of lifetime, this is, these, are, these are unique experiences that people have, I want to say, sort of cultural uniquenesses to help us understand as part of this collective humanity. But at, but at the same time, it is a part of us, right? Because we are all part of this story. So I got very interested in nature because I feel that, you know, I, I started I started working on, um, well, I'd always kind of grown up around hunting. That wasn't so foreign to me, but I started focusing on hunting specifically um, as a way to, my early work looked at themes, well, constantly looked at themes around life and death. And some of my early work, I was working for Time Magazine and doing a lot of stuff on, um, how should you say, like uh, sort of domestic issues in the U.S. and how we deal like with elderly, with dying, um, how we treat elderly in this culture, but then also youth um, that were maybe dealing with themes around suicide and, 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 and like death of parents and things like that. And so I would kind of had this very human tangible reactions to to how we uh, relate to the emotions around death and what and so I started going hunting and what I realized is that I was in nature and I was in these very sort of fine-tuned cycles of life and death but a bit removed from the human emotion of it. And so it allowed me to almost focus a little bit more to, to kind of hone in on what are, what are, what is our role in these cycles of life and death, but without the kind of heaviness that I would feel from, you know, what it means to feel somebody's pain from death. So, so, so I started following these hunters and that was that first project for eight years. So I began following hunters and I found that like, you know, they were, they were guides to me into these, like, like I said, just really something that nature could tell me without the hunters, but they were guides to bring me out there. And then that brought me up into Canada and in different places in the U S and, um, and I began, I kind of noticed that this layer of myself sort of um, became like very fine tuned, like you kind of slough off this old skin and, and you begin to be, become a little bit more fine tuned. And I saw the camera again as a tool to, as I became a little bit like my skin sloughed off, I think the camera uh, reflected that a bit in what I was seeing. And again, I think that ultimately was coming from from um, nature, helping to clarify some things. So I saw hunters as these guides, and then I took that a little bit further, and I was interested in children and hunt, hunting, and and so what it meant for young kids to kind of take on this role in these cycles of life and death in in a really young age, and realize that they were working parts of nature, and what did that look like for them? So not I wasn't really interested. I wasn't interested in trophy hunting, but I was interested in subsistence hunting, mm-hmm. kids that had um, really relationship, you know, kind of cultural familial relationships to hunting. But again, we're looking in Canada and the US. And then what I what I saw, which maybe shouldn't have surprised me, but but I was I was pleasantly surprised, is that all of those children, they would say to me, I want to be a wildlife biologist, I want to be a park ranger. It's through the life of the animal that I understand more how I can communicate and, and relate to my environment. And so that was like the click for me there. I was like, okay, so that's what this is about. This is about our ability as humans to uniquely translate 
our relationship to the natural world. And since the natural world is us as well, and we are a part of it, it's this unique communication of who we are in relationship to our environment. So then I decided, okay, so I wanted to get a deeper understanding of that by living with an original hunter gatherer no, nomadic sort of pastoral society. And I went down to South America first to Peru because I think my, my first, just whatever my, my first, without really thinking my first intuition was to go into, into a rain, rainforest culture. And so I went down there and I spent maybe six weeks or something like that. And in those six weeks, I realized, okay, that I had sort of entered this other layer of what it means to really be working part of nature. Uh, you know, I, I think in, in sort of Occidental society, of course you can find that, but I think we also have somewhat removed ourselves in, in the way that we communicate with the natural world. So I was seeing that, but what I realized is there was so much darkness for me. And, I, and at the time I, I didn't understand what that darkness was. And now I realized it's because I didn't have the ability to understand what was being shown to me. And that's the other thing with the camera is so mind blowing, right? Like the camera has the ability to show us the things we're not even ready to understand yet. And that's what I love about it. So, so, I mean, I, I can, I can, you know, take, takes the wrong word. I can be a part of this sort of revealing process of a conversation um, that, that, that the camera does. And maybe it takes me two years to even understand what the camera was showing me, but that's what's beautiful. So there was a sort of darkness down there. I didn't really understand what was being shown to me. And I found that difficult. And I thought, okay, I, this is important, but I realized I wasn't ready for that yet. I, I didn't have the, the fine-tuned vocabulary to understand the, the, the depth of the rainforest. And so I said, okay, in my mind, what's the total opposite of the rainforest? And I thought, well, that must be the Arctic, which is probably, you know, scientifically really ridiculous, but that was my mind. And so I said, okay, so I'm going to go to the Arctic. And I thought, okay, so what, why the Arctic? I, I had to think even a little bit more than just that. Okay, now I want to take it one step further. Why? Okay, so what, what am I really interested in? And I said, I'm realizing that, that I needed to, with this darkness that I felt, this ability to not understand how people were communicating their part of the natural world, I realized that I needed silence so that I could begin to hear again, because I realized I had so much noise of my own uh, perceptions and construction of my life that I needed to, to shed all of that to be able to hear in a new way. And, and basically, like learning a new language, you need to kind of shed your perceptions and way of seeing the world so you can actually begin to absorb a new language. So I needed that. So I thought, okay, maybe the Arctic would be good for that. And were there people that could uniquely interpret the Arctic landscape for us, whether it be through their, their verbal language, the way that they live their life, um, of course, and so ultimately animal husbandry and this kind of 2,000 or 8,000 year connection, 2,000 years of reindeer herding, 8,000 year connection with the Arctic. And, and then on the, the third part of that was, I, I wanted one lesson from the Arctic of what made us uniquely human in the, in the cycles of life and death. And so that's what brought me up there. And so that sustained those questions. And this is how I know the beginning or end of a story for me. It took me four years for me to have what I considered the answers to those questions. Uh, on a practical, on a practical note, like both of these projects that you you've mentioned were were self assigned. This is stuff that you did on on your own. Mm -hmm. So you're you're working as a you know professional photographer working for magazines and and such. So tell me about just the logistics of being able to create those opportunities for you. Because a lot of people have these wonderful ideas for projects, but financial circumstances or life circumstances make it very difficult to do that. So how, how, how did you coordinate it so that you could dedicate that time to these, to these projects? So specifically for the Sami work, because the Peru work was a quite a short time, at least back then, um, the first trip. So this, the Sami work, um, the first year I went back and forth. So I was, you know, really working pretty, um, I would say, I mean, very heavily, like, all, all the time, <laughs> um, busy, busy working. So I used my own money for the first year um, mm -hmm. to go back and forth, just money that I was making through editorial work or different kind. I was doing annual reports and things like that. So, I mean, I'd already been working for 
I think eight years, you know, at, at working professionally for eight years at that point. So, so the first year I went back and forth. And so I would take money, save it. And I would go for like two weeks, go for a month and, and go back and forth. And then that, after that first year, um, because of course you also don't show up somewhere and say, I'm going to live here for four years. <laughs> That's kind of, I mean, maybe you do. That's a little, I, I needed to kind of ease people into that. You know? So that first year it was, it was a, a bit of a play of, of, you know, going back and forth, using my own money to do it, and then realizing what, how, you know, how I would, in the beginning, I didn't say that I would stay four years. I didn't know that that was going to be, I thought maybe I'd go for a couple months. And about a year or maybe like nine months into it, I realized that, whoa, this is like, actually, I kind of realized it. And also pushing through some mentors said to me, you know what, I remember one specific mentor, his name is Dietmar. And he said to me specifically, because you know what, because I was really struggling. He's like, the only way, Erica, you're going to continue. He's like, you just need to go. And I said, how am I going to do this? Exactly the questions. It's like, how am I going to make a living? How am I going to pay for my apartment in New York? How am I, I, I can't do that. Like, or if I go, I'm never going to work again. And he said, you know what, if you go, Erica, the only thing that's going to change is you. He goes, New York's still going to be here. Apartments are still going to be here. And he goes, and jobs will still be here. The only thing that's going to be different is you. And he said, I don't know how you're going to figure that out. He's like, but what do you really want? And so I applied for this, um, at the time it's called, it was a woman in photography grant done by this um, Amy Elkins and they kind of had put, it was like in the very beginning. And I think it was actually the first grant that they gave out and it was a $5,000 grant. And I applied for it, not thinking, and I got it. And I was like, that was it. That was just the sign. I was like, okay, it's $5,000. It's not a lot, but it'll get me there for the entire summer. And I said, that's the sign that I'm going to go. And I went. And um, at that point, I, f- I had found a house to live in, a family of reindeer herders that needed, I don't know if they needed, let's say they needed it. And I sort of create, we created this experience together. I should say, I should never say anyone needed me there by any means, but I should say that we agreed to this experience. But the Sami have in their culture, what's called a biga. And it would be a woman that traditionally would have come from a family that maybe wasn't as uh, didn't have as many reindeer, so maybe in our terms or not as financially well off, and mm-hmm. and would go help a family that would have more reindeer, and they would live there, and they would they would cook, they would take care of the children, they would sew, they would take care of the skins, and they would slaughter the reindeer, and they would be the ones you know always out on the tundra, and so this family, you know, they this is in there, you know, like again we're we're living in a different time, but this is still a part of the culture, this biga culture, and there's a ranga which would we traditionally be the role a man would take in a similar situation. And so they accepted me as this biga into their house. And so therefore, I had found a place where I could work as what I guess we'd call a housekeeper and an au pair. So I didn't have to pay. So I um, I found a place I didn't have to pay, I could work for my for what I needed to do. And so my money would be for my plane tickets and for my film, because I shot most of it large format film. And also digital and different things. It's not important. So I was able to do that. And then once that, once I was there for a few months and realized this is working out, I applied for a Fulbright, but way after college, but you can get these Fulbright grants after college, like, you know, you can get them in, you know, in, in older ages. And, and um, so I had applied for a Fulbright and then that gave me a visa to stay longer and it gave me more money. And then I ended up signing up. There's a Sami university in the village that I was in. And I learned, uh, I, anyway, so it's a year long course where you can take it, you can get a PhD in it. But I took the first year course in Sami language, uh, North Sami language to be specific. And there was stipendiums given out for learning Sami language because it's an endangered language. And so therefore, then I got another grant for learning Sami language. And so everything just over the time and then probably a few years into it, I, w- I began selling the work as well. So, you know, like Reader's Digest did a piece on the Sami Rangers, who would have known? But so all these little things made a difference. You know, then I was kind of located in this isolated part of Northern Norway. And I was, then I started getting some work. So like Fortune Small Business was around at the time and they hired me to do something on Norwegian businesses. They just other small magazines would give me assignments, but that all, I mean, all of that piled in. So yeah, I made it work. Yeah, your friend <laughs> gave you some very good advice. Yeah, <laughs> just... <laughs> While other podcasts, both big and small, interrupt interviews with ads and sponsors, we give you the entire unedited conversation each week. 
That may not be the smartest thing to do from a business perspective, but for right now, I just want to focus on having these conversations and sharing them with you. So this is a listener-supported show, which is rare for a podcast that's been around for this long and has an audience of its size. So we rely on your generosities to supplement the cost of production and provide us the time to dedicate to each episode. If you like what you're hearing, you can demonstrate your support by becoming a Patreon supporter today. Join our Patreon effort for as little as $5 a month. It's a modest dollar amount, but makes a big difference. Sign up today by visiting patreon.com forward slash The Candid Frame. Thank you. The circumstances under which you were living likely resulted in circumstances where you learned a lot about what you thought you were capable of. Mm. Right? You just didn't just drop in there just to make photographs. Like you said, you had all these, you had to learn how to cook. You had to learn how to treat the, uh, the reindeer that it have slaughtered and do all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, stuff that you probably never imagined yourself doing when you were six years old. But, <laughs> or, or maybe it was exactly what I imagined myself doing. <laughs> no, it was like, that's the whole, so that's the part of it for me. Like, I've never, and this is where I feel, I mean, you know, this is like, no, it gets into more, a little more, but like, how should I say it? This is the part where, when, you know, when what you do is so much a part of your identity, it's great. But when you, I guess when your economic way of life is tied into it, it can be really crappy. So, mm-hmm. um, but um, no, I mean, th- there would be no other way for me. I think this is the way that, I mean, this is the story, right? That, that is the story. So, and each one's different. It's not that I have to, every time I tell a story, I have to become a biga and learn how to skin an animal. That's not what I mean, but that was this story. And I believe that was, that was the story. It was like, and, and the reason I know that is because like, that's, how should I say? Also, it's, it's not something that I said it had to be this way. This was the story. I believe storytelling is collective I, as much as it's. And, and so it was a story that the, with these, these families of Sami reindeer herders that specifically that I worked with, this is the story that we created together and that they allowed me to take part in, if you can kind of say that. And, but by allowing me, it was also me being open to doing it in that way. And so I didn't, nothing like I never found it surprising or strange or it just always was going to be that way. And it's exactly how it worked out. But what's interesting is there's no formula to it. It's not like I have to go make my next story. I don't have to live for four years. I don't have to learn the language. I don't have to do, it's not, but that's what I had to do with the Sami. The next story will dictate what I need to embody and what I need, what lessons. And ultimately I think at the core for me is what lessons I need to learn because that's what these stories are about. And, and, um, in the very selfish way. And I mean that truly, like I'm not making stories because I'm, I'm making stories because I believe these are lessons I need to be learning personally. And then once I learn them, there is, like I said, I think we are part of a uh, old, old, old tradition of storytelling. So that's just kind of, part of the genetic makeup. <laughs> yeah. One of the uh, interesting stories that you did was one, one for National Geographic in collaboration with Garrison Keillor. <laughs> and that was more about memory, about thinking back on the life, more so than what was actually happening then and there. Mm-hmm. So it's very different from the project we, that we just talked about. Not only are you working intimately in relationship to a writer, but you sort of have to reimagine a life visually, right? It's not like you can just photograph him here here and now because that's not the story. So we're talking about story, but how do you, how do you tell a story whose events have already passed? (laughs) That's where the camera, I am not doing it. That's the camera, right? So that's the thing. Like if, so my belief and that, the past, present, and future are all happening at the same time. And the camera is this amazing tool to just to take us there. And mm-hmm. I really believe it. I know it sounds, I might not, but I, I believe it so much. I know what you're saying, that, that, that this story perhaps already passed, and perhaps it did, but it didn't for me. So what I had to do, I had to kind of rewire myself to think about how to, it's kind of like an astronaut, right? Like I, I had to kind of, 
learn all the techniques to be able to get into that realm of that story because it was kind of operating on another plane. But I have to do that with every story. So um, and so I, I did some thinking about okay, how would I how would I do that? And to be honest, when I initially got the story, I turned it down because I said, there's no way I can do this. <laughs> so, I did, I, I, so I put up my own block. I said, there's no way I can do this. How, I'm, how am I going to so eloquently enter these realms in a way that somebody like Garrison can do with his words? And I think, and do it in, you know, just, I, 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 kind, of, I kind of thought it was silly to even try to visually do it, right? in a way for me. And then I broke through that and I was like, okay, forget that. Like, I'm going to do this. And so what I did was I took his written story. So the one, typically I don't have it this way, right? Um, The story was already, I always think the story is already there anyways, but this in this case, it was really like legitimately on a piece of paper. So I was able to read it. And so I used the story as a map. And then I took it as like kind of like a time traveling map. And so I believed it is not only this physical map on the wall, but now with the camera, I'm going to enter it and therefore go into different, you know, times, times, times that through Garrison's words and through his own, right? He, he lived this. So therefore those feelings and those memories exist. They don't just go away. These things are real. Energy's real. So, okay, I, I, so I'm going to take this map and enter it and use his words to do that. And so I, um, I started by moving to Minnesota during the times that I was working on the project and moving in with Garrison and his wife. And so when he got the email, he thought I was coming for like two days. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I'm like, I didn't want me to tell 70 years in two days. I was like, that's not going to work. But then I kind of told him, I was like, well, maybe I'll spend two days with you, but I'm going to need a lot longer to use this story. But it was so he, he, you know, he got that around his, you know, in, in the sphere and it made sense. So I, I worked. Yeah, I, saw, okay. I saw that email where he said 10 weeks. <laughs> yeah, it was, like, oh, and it was way longer than 10 weeks. It was way, we worked on it from, we worked on it almost a year. It was, it was a long time, but 10 oh, weeks wow. is good. I think that doesn't sound that intimidating, but apparently it did. But anyway, so what I did is I, I moved in into his place where he was at, you know, in, in, in St. Paul on Summit Avenue at the time, um, you know, they gave me a room to stay in. And then what I did was ask him, you know, I, I want to start, I, I did it sort of linearly or chronologically, if you want to say. So I went back and said, let me start at your childhood. So I went in and I would go to like his mother's home and stay. And his mother had, had just died a, a few months before. And so, but, so they still had the home and everything was sort of the same. So I went in and stayed in the home and, you know, read her Bible and sat on the chairs and all that. And then went to... Um, a community in Oka where he had grown up and um, he was part of this church called the Plymouth Brethren. And I went in and with all, with met his cousins and w- went to, you know, and, and, and became, you know, got to understand them. So I imagined what that, you know, through his cousins, so through these other generations, you could have some bit of ancestral memory of what that might've been like for him. Of course, you can't project onto someone else that they are garrison, but, but some, you know, in, in bringing into those, those realms. And, and so I was able to do that and live with some of the families there for a bit. And then I would move on and I would go to the University of Michigan. And uh, and, and so as he got older, um, you see his mind thinking in a different way, right? Than he does as a kid, as we all do. So when, when I went to University of Michigan, I, I would, I went, or excuse me, sorry, um, University of Minnesota, I went to the graduate program and I, I put out a call for two young, young men uh, and from different backgrounds. And, uh, and so two answered. And so I did it that way because I, I wanted to understand, right? I imagine that Garrison and had this life like sort of as a white male in 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 this time period but i wanted to understand you know he was also getting all these mirrors of other lifestyles now too right outside of this the, the, the lifestyle he had as, as a as a child with the plymouth brethren was seemed more kind of insular so then i so so i so i photo, so i followed two young graduate writing students um to kind of see like how he maybe was, but how he might have been perceived as well. And, and all, I don't know, I can't really explain it. The words don't explain it. But then, so I, so I, I did that. And that's so why I went to parties. Um, and that was, you know, kind of imagine what like Garrison was like when he was sort of his budding sexuality and things like that. And, and then he, ta- then he, you know, then he sort of has, you know, you, you, you know it through his writing that he falls in love with the world. Uh, you know, he falls in, he falls in love with his state and in these, in these, you know, the things that make it up. So he writes eloquently about the Foshe 
shade tower. So I remember going on the full shade tower on a full moon because it would be, you know, lit and all that you could use the ambient light with the moonlight. And I got all dressed up and wanted to like imagine what it would be like to, to be in the time of the full shade tower and, Anyways, so that's, anyways, that's how I did the, the, you know, and so on and so forth. And at the end, and so I'd say photographically, I only took one, I, I went on a long ride with Garrison one time. I mean, I spent lots of time with Garrison, but I only went to photograph him once. And we went on a really long ride and I said, take me somewhere or take me nowhere. And he took me nowhere. He literally just took me nowhere. And we just drove and drove and drove. We stopped and I photographed him and then we turned around and that was it. It's the only time I ever photographed him the whole entire year. But what was interesting is that on the way home, a Prairie Home Com Companion came on the radio and it was super interesting and he didn't put it on in any kind of egotistical way, but it just mm -hmm. like, it was amazing. It was like very important for me to understand in that moment to be driving in the car with him and hearing a Prairie Home Companion to realize the depth of storytelling because right listening to him tell a story but being with him in photo i mean these are all different things they're not the same thing these are all different levels of how we choose to communicate the you know the different layers of what it means to be human and also the different relationships that we have to the timelines of our lifetime and these are all different you know whether he's reflecting back at 70 versus when he wrote it at 20 these are we are we embody we are the same thing but we embody different things so it was really incredible to, to do that. Anyway, it's not so, really long-winded. <laughs> hey, I love long-winded. That's fine. That's why I don't interrupt. <laughs> when you're working on something for an extended period of time, you have to be careful in terms of not getting lost in just producing pictures, you know, because especially if you're working on something for a long time, you've got to go through all those photographs, whether you're shooting film or digital. So you you, you mentioned earlier for, for one of the projects you were using film and digital. I'm not sure exactly what you're doing now, but but in terms of just sheer quantity and being able to process that, not just, I'm not talking just in terms of what you do in Photoshop or anything like that, but in terms of processing those images and finding the story that lies lies within the images. How How does that work for you? To be honest, I like, I mean, I do spend extended periods of time, but I don't photograph that much. Meaning, I mean, pro well, I guess that's all relative, right? Sorry, that's pretty relative. What I should say is that, I, I mean, how do I say? Like, I don't have time. I mean, I, I still shoot a lot of large format film. And so that's going to obviously limit how many pictures that you have in general. Um, mm -hmm. And I do shoot a lot of digital, but even when I'm shooting digital, like I'm, I'm pretty slow and deliberate in in that process i think like sometimes i mean i might have two or three versions of one situation and that's probably it the most of what you see is if i'm if i'm going if i'm doing a, a, a portrait you know maybe i'm going to have 50 photographs of that portrait and that's it when i did this project on the women the women of impact the largest you know, edit, we had to go through a 60 pictures. So that's, it's not that many. So I would say that um, I'm pretty like, you know, um, I, I don't take tons of pictures. And then on top of that, then the editing process, that's a whole nother thing, right? So that becomes a sort of, again, sort of this meta idea of how we relate to story. And um, so what, perhaps what I would choose in the moment of being in, the, in that house with Garrison, what image I would choose is going to be very different than, a, than an image I would choose a year later. And so I, I tend to rely more on, on the extension of time for my editing process. Of course, if I have it on these long-term projects, of course, I don't have it if I'm doing something for, you know, whatever, for a news magazine, it needs to be done tomorrow. Of course, that's different. But I think um, when you have the luxury of time, I think um, time edits for you. So, you know, if you can wait a year to look at your work, you know, the story is very, very clear. I mean, maybe I'm kind of vacillating between like one photograph of a pair of shoes. Like, do I like it in that angle or that angle? But, but, the, but the images themselves, it's not that difficult of a process for me to, to edit down. That makes a whole lot of sense looking at your photographs then, because you don't take the obvious photograph. The images that you, you take, even if there are of subject matter that would provide really dramatic images, tend to be of moments on the periphery. You know, along with the portraits, they're just these quiet moments that tell you about 
you know, the circumstances, the people, the, the, the culture. So it, it makes all the more sense with you explaining what your process is. I guess uh, recognizing, it kind of goes back to what I was asking you earlier, is about recognizing that, that, that moment and taking to it with a certain level of, of grace, because it seems like the people are very present with you when you are where people are the subject of the photograph. Like there's one photograph that you took that really literally took my breath away, which is of a woman with a blonde hair with a very weathered face, um, mm. wearing a powder blue dress or something like that. I saw that image and I just went. <gasps> She's an older woman sitting on the ground. Like it's just a face, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And I love when I see an image where I have a physical reaction to it. It doesn't happen very often, but I saw that and it was just like, and I look at that that photograph and visually in terms of all the sort of photographic roles, it, it, it has it all. Wonderful light, wonderful subject matter. But there's a moment there, even though she's not looking directly at the camera and doing anything. And it's just like, it's it's a magical thing. And I'm, and I'm, I'm just kind of curious about the story behind behind that, that photograph, because I think it probably speaks to um, your approach just generally when you're photographing. So yeah, that was a so that was part of a project we did. Um, I did for Geographic. I was part of a, a team. Like there were seven, or depending on the time, between seven to ten of us that were covering um, Yellowstone, um, the greater not just Yellowstone Park, but the greater Yellowstone ecosystem um, for part of this um, kind of pay tribute to the centennial, uh, the anniversary for the national parks. I got hired to do the. Uh, the port, like the voice, they call the voices of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And so actually that was, that would be specifically a project where I worked on for over many, like, I think I was, I think we were in the field for two years. So we worked over two years, but I only went several times. And I, I, I mean, probably the longest amount of time I had with anyone was one of them where I had spent a weekend with him, this winter keeper at the park kind of, um, you know, so because we, we had to kind of get dropped in and, and come out. So I had to spend the weekend there and that was the longest. So um, with Becky, the woman you're talking about, um, she is a sheep farmer and also a big, um, if you want to say advocate for a uh, wild like predator versus like livestock management in terms of the, it, it, um, how should you say she would be meaning like you mitigate it through just the, the way that you work your land as opposed to like taking out a gun and shooting a wolf. It's like, okay, how much time do I work? Do I become a working part of this landscape in order to under and sort of mitigate this? My, I'm going to have all this livestock. So how am I going to, to, to uh, build this relationship with the predators and, and still kind of successfully do what I need to do. And so that was sort of her approach in her philosophy. So you can imagine, you know, I, I think portraits are, I believe that portraits, so portraits are probably my favorite thing ever. I think portraits, I love them. And I think you can, honestly, you can be in a portrait for 30 seconds and that's all you need, or you can spend eight years, right? But you can literally, you can, I mean, that's all it can be. And that 30 seconds can be a lifetime. I do not, I mean, and so anyway, so to get to your point, two things, when I'm actually photographing, I don't talk at all like almost not at all. So I, um, like all the talking I'm doing now doesn't exist. And um, so let's say I'm out with her in the field for like an hour, we were walking around. So first of all, we're walking on her landscape. So she's probably going to feel comfortable. We're, she, I'm not taking her out into a foreign place. This is her land. So all of a sudden there's going to be this level of comfort. And then I'm asking her to teach me, like literally, I mean, not, not in saying, hey, you know, like teach me, but there's, I'm asking her to show me something. And I am as much as I can be of myself. Again, it, that could be, it's all relative, but I kind of am deeply listening, you know, as much as I, as, you know, again, that's relative. Someone else, you know, maybe like a monk says, oh, that's not listening at all. So I, I don't know, it depends, but as much as I can, so I kind of turn on that part of me that's, that's about listening and then that's it. And then I kind of, you know, maybe, I mean, I'm not going to be rude. If she says something, I might answer back, but I pretty much don't talk. And so I, and then I, and, and then I think in that silence is when the real conversation happens. And that's where that moment comes from. And I mm -hmm. think it's nothing that I've created. I think it is what she chose to show me in that moment. And I think it speaks of her probably, probably, 
if I could guess, and I don't know, this is, again, I'm not one to, per- I don't know what goes on in people's heads and I could spend lifetime with them or I have a son and a husband and I don't know ever what's going on in their heads. So, but what I would imagine is that, you know, that moment is a part of, especially because I'm there with the camera and I'm asking them who they are. So it is a part of, it's the part that they wanted me to see in, mm-hmm. in, that, in that exchange. And whatever that means is what it means. And that might be a part that's not even real. I don't know. Yeah. So. In some of your presentations, you read from journal entries. And how important is your writing in terms of your, your process? And why is it important? Yeah, so the writing for me, it's really important. And I don't, you know, and it's, it's really important because um, I think if the writing is the part of me that's not as clear, like, right now, I've been using the camera for a long time. And we have to remind ourselves that, like, the writing is like the part of me that's probably even maybe more unconscious than the the photography. I'm not very, I'm not a writer. I'm not a wordsmith. I don't have this kind of beautiful skill, but the words are really important. So I, and I tend to write them kind of free and formed. And then I go back and form poems after, but the poems probably, I would say the writing in all reality is probably way, way, way more about me than it is about. So I'm not a journalist and I would never say that I was, but the the writing is probably, it's, it's my reflections of what the camera is taking me to learn and to understand. And I would say that the camera is not just my perspective on a situation. I would say the camera is the exchange like that for me. And I'm not saying everyone, but I don't think that I'm like directing the picture. Like, I think it is, it is this, ex- this communication exchange that I, that's what I believe. It's the best, the most pure form that I have of communicating um, is with, is that exchange with the camera. And so I think the writing is probably a lot more about me and my, my, per- my perceptions of the world and probably my background and where I come from and how I perceive time and space and, and all these things. And, and also how I am, you know, what stamp I'm sort of putting on what I think this experience was all about too, right. in my, from my perspective. So that's where the writing comes in. And so again, it's, it's a selfish form or I know selfish is the wrong word. I don't know if selfish doesn't have to be negative, but it's the, it's the processing part of me um, that's necessary to kind of learn that new language which is me catching up to the photograph, catching up to the conversation that the people and the experiences and the landscape and the environments um, have, have, have opened up and, and given me a chance to, to, to intuitively f- see and feel. Well, my last question that I ask each guest is I ask them to recommend another photographer, and it can be anyone, someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered. So who would that one photographer be and why? Oh, there's so many. I guess everyone says that. There's way too many. No, you can't do that. One <laughs> photographer. No way. Um, well, achieve me. No, you can't do that. I don't know. The first person that comes to my mind um, and is, you know, um, Evgenia Arbogaeva? No, I don't think so. Oh, so or, and she goes by Genya. Her work is like she is like, okay, if there is a realm of like, how should I say, like we talk about like how time and space and all these things are, you know, like she can, she has this way to like put on her astronaut suit and jump into the magic of, of like worlds between worlds. And her, her work is metaphorical and real and like, it's, 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 it's mind blowing. And it's actually like scary and how like mm-hmm. tactile and crazy that she can like the, how she can enter those worlds and still exist on like pff, this human plane. I don't even know, but she's, she's wow. just, she's mind. She's really, she's mind blowing. I am a okay. huge admirer of her and as a person too. She's a great person. So. I look forward to checking that out. That sounds yeah. very <laughs> Well, Eric, thank you so much. It was a real pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Thanks to Erica for joining us. Find out more about her and her work by visiting ericalarsonphoto.com. 
If you're a devoted listener and subscribe to the show, write us a review on whatever service you'll listen to podcast. Those reviews have led people to take a chance on our show and allowed us to grow. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and our mailing list. On the YouTube channel, I offer critiques on images submitted by TCF listeners like you, while the mailing list keeps you updated with all TCF events, including workshops and more. Sign up today. And remember, you can support the show by contributing to our Patreon effort or a one-time or recurring donation via PayPal. Thanks to Susan Sanders and Chris Martin for their recent contributions. We also provide a series of ebooks on photography available for purchase on our website. It's my way of sharing my experience and knowledge for making great photographs and another way for you to support the show. And if you find that you can't find every episode of the show, download the Candid Frame app, which is available for both Apple iOS and Android. And because of your generosity, it's free to download and use. No additional purchases are required. The Candid Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at the other martintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker. And our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty-free music can be found at incompetech.com. And this is Ibarian X, and this is The Candid Frame.